What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another video. Today we'll be looking at which running backs I would be selling high on and buying low on. One very important thing to remember is that trades are best executed when you're filling a need of the other team. You know, you can't just blindly send a trade offer uh, like about the players we're talking about and expect a bunch of deals to get done, right? You should be selling to teams with a need at the running back position and buying from teams who have an abundance at the position. That's how you're gonna have the most success when you're trading. Also, I believe I'm gonna talk about seven running backs today, but it's possible you can't, or maybe just don't wanna get a deal done with these specific seven. And if that's the case, then you can just look at the trade targets page on our website. I'll update that every Tuesday, and it's gonna have you know more names than I post in this video. I'll also update the rest of season rankings every Tuesday afternoon. So you can just use that as a trade targets tool as well. You know, we want to be trading for players who are higher in the rest of season rankings than the people you currently have. So all that information is available on the website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. All right, we'll go over all these running backs in a second, but first, of course, have to start things off as usual, the stat of the day. Yesterday's stat was who led all tight ends in route percentage through week one. I guess it was through Sunday was the stat. Uh, and again, route percentage is routes per drop back. So the percentage of drop backs that a tight end ran a route in. The answer was actually Tyler Higby. Gentleman Jared was the first to get that right on YouTube. And at Travis Gannell was the first to get that right on Twitter. Taste that. What team ran the fewest plays in week one? Maybe gonna see a little bit of positive regression in total plays per game. Okay, let's go over some trade charts. First up, we're gonna do all the sell highs. And the first name on the list is Melvin Gordon. Gordon had 11 carries for 101 yards and a score to go along with three receptions, 17 yards on three targets. That's 19.3 fantasy points, making him the running back six through week one. That is a really, really nice week. The problem is 67% of those fantasy points came on his final carry of the game. Before that, he was tied for the running back 36 on the week with 6.3 fantasy points. And the biggest issue was that he was already out carried by Javante Williams 11 to 14 for Williams. And while he had more receptions, three targets is not like a, a massive opportunity share. I was expecting the split, you know, I was expecting a split between the two of them. Like I thought that it would be like relatively close, but I was still expecting Melvin Gordon to be like the pretty clear one to start the season. Of course, if you watched our off season content, you know, I'm very high on Javante Williams. And I thought that as the season progressed, he would slowly take more and more work. Maybe they'd start having like a complete split in like week three, week four. And then after that, you know, we'd slowly see Williams maybe take over. But for right out of the gates, Williams to be already matching the volume of Gordon and like exceeding him on the ground, like that's just not a good sign for Gordon because we expect this to continue even further as the season goes on. There's also uh, this Jerry Judy injury which isn't like the end-all be-all for Melvin Gordon. You might not even have like made a connection between the two, but it's important to note that like Jerry Judy was so clearly the alpha on this offense. I mean, it's just so unfortunate he had this injury because he was crushing in that game. He was the go-to guy. He was the number one receiver in this offense. And so when you lose that, like they still have quality receivers. Hamler's going to step up. I believe Tim Patrick is a very talented wide receiver. He's going to step up. But regardless, like it's a downgrade for the offense. And whenever you downgrade the offense, that's bad for the offensive pieces, unless they're the ones that are filling the injury, which obviously is not happening with Melvin Gordon. So if the offense is a little bit worse, if they're maybe not playing the Giants every week, a team that you know they were going to beat, like it was just it was a good week for Gordon but not as good as it seemed and everything's going to slowly get worse. And so if you can trade high on him, I would be doing that. Uh, another so high candidate is like three running backs or four running backs to count all of them is literally just any Houston Texans running back. This one might be tough to pull off because I think most people understand that the Texans are not a good team, but there are absolutely 
people out there that have seen headlines that are saying like, oh, Houston's going to be run heavy. They see Houston score 37 points. They see all the running backs score touchdowns and like, oh, wow, you know, they're actually going to use these running backs and they might be good. No, this was one explosion that is it's simply not going to happen every single week, no matter what the offense is, and especially if the offense is the Houston Texans, they're going to get crushed in a lot of games, and they're not going to be able to run the ball as much as this last week. Like, if you have any of these running backs you took really late, now is the time to capitalize on that. Like, a lot of them are probably your last pick, or maybe you picked them up off free agency. If that is the case, trade them away. Trade them to someone who thinks this offense is going to be even, like, a little bit okay, because they're not going to be. They're not going to score all these touchdowns. They're not going to be able to run the ball as much with these running backs. Please trade them away if you have them to anyone who's willing to give you something of value. I would also sell high on Jamal Williams. Um, I talked about this yesterday in the uh, the re- reactions from week one video, but we need to like understand, I know I keep saying it, but please understand what it means when the Lions ran 84 offensive plays with a lot of those coming in the fourth quarter, right? Since they were playing from behind, so they had to play fast, they recovered an onside kick, they recovered a fumble, like they ran 31 plays in the fourth quarter alone. Washington only ran 49 plays over the entire game. Like 31 plays in the fourth quarter is a crazy high amount. So we need to like downgrade a little bit all the production that this team had because they're not going to run 14 more plays per game than the best team from last season. These are going to drop. So we have to reduce the totals from the players we saw go off in that game. Now, like I did say in yesterday's video, the arrow is still pointing up for Williams. I don't want you guys to confuse that with like, oh, Williams and Swift are not good. They're going to be good this season. I am not denying that. But there are absolutely teams in your league that need help with the running back position. There are probably, I would say on average, like three to four teams, like a 12-team league, every year they just desperately need help. Like maybe they went RB0, maybe they had injuries, like they drafted Gus, they drafted Dobbins if you drafted a while ago but they drafted some of these running backs that got hurt some running backs that busted and so they need help probably 25 percent of your league needs help and it's very likely that you drafted williams as like your fourth or your fifth running back um i did look back at the rankings and i listed him as a target in the ninth round um but that was like six or seven spots above adp for just running back so it's probably like around two to three rounds ahead of where you could get him And so if we're thinking about someone we drafted in that range, they're probably our fourth or fifth best running back, and we probably went heavy at other positions early. And so he's one of your last bench spots, right? And if that's the case, it is a really, really good return on investment. Taking a player like that who just put up 100 and was it 110 total yards and a score in week one with a lot of receptions, like he went off. He's a running back one overall right now but not for the rest of the season. So if you can take someone like that that you invested such little capital into and flip them for something really nice that you can use every single week, I would do it. I am not giving him away, right? I still, again, think the arrow is pointing up. I think he's going to be valuable. But I think it's best to do a trade where you're upgrading a piece. Maybe you want to upgrade wide receiver. You package Jamal Williams with a bench wide receiver. Maybe someone like Marvin Jones who also had a really nice week one. Um, Marvin Jones plus Jamal Williams, and can you flip that for uh, a really quality wide receiver too? Can you flip that for, hey, maybe a team uh, has a higher-end running back that we're going to talk about in this video, okay? And so maybe they're down on that running back a little bit, but they still want to receive a running back in a trade, so you give them a wide receiver, you give them Jamal Williams, and you're able to upgrade Williams into a like buy low candidate at running back so those are the type of deals i do like i wouldn't be doing one for one deals williams for another running back because that just kind of is bad like most of those deals are just kind of lateral movements and you don't end up gaining anything i'd be packaging the two for the one and then you open up a bench spot so you can add like your favorite uh waiver wire option as well so those are what i would do for williams and really any trade i would always be trying to do a two for one so who are some running backs that could be the one? Who are some running backs that had disappointing week ones, but we expect to increase in value moving forward, and I would be buying right now. First name on this list is Saquon Barkley, as long as you don't pay too much. This one is more 
um, send an offer out and, and kind of like gauge what their level of interest is. A lot of people will just not trade him. And so just know that it's just like good to gain that information. Be like, okay, they're not going to trade Saquon. Don't even think about them. Move on to other trade partners. Um, but kind of gauge what people's level of interest is with Saquon. Again, I'm not paying a running back one price tag. Uh, but obviously, like he had an awful game, right? 10 carries for 26 yards, one reception for one yard. That's bad. That's that's really bad for someone. I mean, they probably draft him like the late first round, right? But we've, we've known all summer he was going to start off slow, right? He's working back. It was his first game back from the torn ACL. Uh, every single report said he was going to be limited. He said he'd be limited. The coach said he'd be limited. We, we knew that going in, right? And the game was a blowout in like the fourth quarter. I'm not sure how much he played in the fourth quarter, but watching that game briefly, I don't think it was much. Uh, we saw Booker a lot in the fourth quarter. Um, I don't believe he had very many, if any, real touches in the fourth quarter. So if the game is more competitive, if he's gaining health, he's going to have a lot more touches. He's going to be used in, honestly, those garbage time plays when you can gain some, uh, some receptions for free, basically. But overall, just remember, it was a brutal matchup. Broncos are not a defense we're looking to attack this season. It's a brutal matchup. His first game back from the injury, bad game script. I mean, we expected him to start slow, and then he did. So what does this mean for us? It means that, like, just, just look at the Saquon team. What do they look like? Are they thin at running back to where, like, a bust from Saquon just kills them because they have to start him every week and they have nothing else behind them. Well, then maybe we do like a Williams trade. You send in Williams, you send in another bench running back, you send in a bench wide receiver. Like you just give them multiple players if they're thin at other spots for that one. That's what I'd be doing. Um, again, I don't think it is a fantastic idea trading for him at running back one value because this is still a bad team. But this is Saquon Barkley. He's going to be good at some point this season. Um, best trades are probably if you're deep at wide receiver. So if the Saquon team is thin at wide receiver, most of the people who watch this channel built very, very deep wide receiver teams. Now is your opportunity. If you had a few wide receivers in your bench go off and you've got plenty of starters, package multiple bench options and maybe one of your starters for Saquon. That's how I think uh, the best deals get done for Saquon this week. I'd also be buying low on Najee Harris. He played 58 offensive snaps while Snell and Balazs combined for zero. Just think about that. In his first NFL game, he didn't leave the field. He played in 100% of the snaps, and they did not give another running back a single touch. That is volume you simply do not find, especially in today's game where we see committees everywhere, right? Harris had a brutal matchup in Buffalo. That is one of the most difficult places historically to play. And so the results were bad. They were really bad. But again, that was one of the most difficult matchups he's going to have all season. And if he keeps playing every single snap, the yardage will be there. The receptions will be there. The touchdowns will be there. So make sure you're at least sending an offer because he scored like four and a half points and you had to take him in the second round uh, in most leagues. I want to say maybe I got him in the early third round. I can't actually remember. I had the turn. So I grabbed uh, Kamara one, Najee two, I want to say, and then Waller in the third. But now I'm forgetting if it flipped and it was Waller than Najee. But the point is you got him in like that range, which is a lot. Okay, and that was the one league that I lost this week, last week. I went 2-0. I lost by three points after getting uh, four and a half points from Najee Harris and zero points from Brandon Ayuk. So I share in the pain of all the Najee Harris and Brandon Ayuk owners out there. Now, I know that basically any offer that gets sent to me for Harris this week, I am declining because I know I'd be selling low and I know he's going to be good this season. But not everyone is going to think like that. There will be plenty of people who are like, oh, I should not have drafted this rookie. I should have listened to all the people who said the offensive line is bad. And they're not going to understand that he was in on every single play. And this is, it was not a good game for the offense of Pittsburgh, even winning that game. The offense looked bad because it was such a hard environment to play in. But over time, Harris is going to have some explosion weeks. And he's going to be very, very good, especially at the running back position, which is a very thin one, a very important one to hit on. There aren't very many players who have even the chance to play as much as he can. 
And so you've got to be trading for them when they post 4.1 points. I will also be buying low on Antonio Gibson, which might surprise people after the Fitz injury. Like his value obviously went down after Fitz got injured, but we've been hoping and speculating all off season that his usage would increase and our prayers were answered. He had very, very high usage in week one. He handled 20 carries, five targets, despite only 49 plays for Washington. That means that Gibson was used on 51% of their plays. That is incredible usage. It is also worth noting that Gibson ran 13 routes compared to nine for McKissick, and he out-targeted him five to one. McKissick what was, was what was limiting the upside, the ceiling for Gibson last year, right? Because he had some really, really good games on the ground, but it was McKissick who was seeing all those like explosion weeks for receptions. Well, if Gibson is now the one that's going to be used more through the air, his ceiling gets even higher. And so try to buy low on him now when we see that injury, because now in people's head, they're like, oh, the offense is going back to being awful. Like maybe it's going to be bad. But if Gibson is seeing half of the touches, half of the volume, I mean, if he's getting 20 carries to go along with multiple receptions, and we know the receptions will be there because they're going to be losing games now with Heineke as their backup, it's not a bad time to be trading for him. Do not offer the value that it took to get him in the draft. We are trying to buy low, which means you're sending less than what it costs to get him at the initial draft. Send an offer. See what people are gauging his value at, because I think it's going to be lower than it should be. Looking back at that exact same game, we've lost an Eckler. Another really, really good buy low. Uh, box score did not look great. 15 carries for 57 yards does get the touchdown. But he had zero targets, and that is going to be a cause for concern for a lot of people. The thing is, Eckler ran 25 routes, which is a pretty high number. It's not like an insane number. You know, he wasn't out there running a route in every play, but 25 routes is a lot to run for a running back. And it's not like they had some other running backs doing the work. Like, I'd be concerned if there was some other running back, like Roundtree, Jackson, uh, was going out there and commanding like seven, eight targets, right? The Chargers only attempted one target to a running back. That is not going to happen week over week. I have not... Uh, seen yet, I don't think it's been posted, um, expected fantasy points numbers from this last week, but I am guessing that Eckler's will be higher than people think, especially considering he didn't get a target, right? Because expected fantasy points like are going to increase a lot when you're getting a lot of targets because those are potential uh, really high upside plays. Those are really high value touches. You can get any of those. And so I think people are going to see the 15 carries and be like, oh, he had like barely any you know, expected fantasy points. I don't want to trade for him. But one key thing with Eckler was people were wondering, is he going to use the goal line back, right? And as per Ben Gretsch, he had four green zone carries on four separate drives. And that's incredibly important. A lot of times we see a running back that have like five green zone carries. I'm like, wow, look at all those potential touchdowns. But it was like, you know, four of them came on, and a green zone carry is like inside the 10. So those are more valuable than looking at red zone carries. It's when they get really close, they're giving them uh, the carries. So if a guy has like five green zone carries, but four came on one drive, that wasn't five potential touchdowns. You know, it was like four times he was trying to get the same touchdown. So maybe it was like two potential touchdowns, right? But if Eckler is getting four green zone carries and four different drives, he's very clearly a guy they're going to give the football when they get close, which means his touchdown upside is high. And we already know, even with the zero targets, his reception upside is very, very, very high. And so I was encouraged with what I saw in week one. And I think everyone should be encouraged because that was really, really nice volume even if the box score doesn't look like it and since basically everyone just looks at the box score and forms opinions based on that we can capitalize on that again as for all the players we will ever do in these buy lows we're not trying to buy them at market cost we're trying to buy them at below market cost hopefully they have an abundance at running back hopefully they are just upset with how much they gave up to get them and you can get them at a discount. So that's what I would do for every single running back here. Do not pay the price it costs to get them on draft day. So that'll do it for the week two running back trade targets video. I'll be posting more names on the website uh, tonight for me, yesterday for you guys. So if you want to see a larger list of running backs to trade for and away, then you can check that out again on the website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. I also added the droppable players list, uh, which will be updated every Tuesday before waiver claims. 
Uh, the waiver wire targets gets posted on Mondays, updated on Tuesdays if there needs to be an update from that game on Monday night. Uh, the rest of season rankings get updated on Tuesdays, rankings after that, and a whole lot more. So plenty of information for you guys to check out. Again, all at our website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. That, my friends, is the end of this one. Hope you all enjoy. If you did, then how about hitting that like button, and how about subscribing to the channel if you're new here? Thanks for watching.